This linkage, of course, was no silver bullet, and I want to add some of my own commentary to the facts that uh, Ambassador Rapp mentioned. Uh, with that linkage, cooperation did not proceed in a straight line, either in terms of its effect on recalcitrant governments or in its implementation by the state actors that conceived and adopted the very policy. Um, I want to look at two sh snapshots in relation to Serbia uh, to help flesh out what I see as the important step forward but inconsistent and wavering quality of state support for the tribunal's mandate at various moments. We saw uh, in March 2004 again the United States government cut off uh, economic funds after a period of particular obstruction by the uh, government in Belgrade. This contributed to a dramatic increase in the phenomena of voluntary surrenders in early 2005. Uh, nonetheless, some of the most senior indictees remained at liberty. Uh, the Belgrade authorities promised to arrest Ratko Mladic, but took no demonstrable action to execute that commitment. And on the basis of that failure, in early May 2006, the European Union suspended the stabilization talks bringing prospects for Serbia's accession to the EU to a halt. Significantly, at this time, other political factors began to loom larger in the picture. In May 2006, Montenegro voted to secede from Serbia. At the same time, independence for Kosovo loomed more likely. By the end of that same year, these concerns began to influence the implementation of the, content of the uh, conditionality policy. Even though no progress had been made in arresting Ratko, Ratko Mladic at the time, NATO offered Belgrade the prospect of joining the Partnership for Peace. The European Union, increasingly feeling a need to placate Belgrade, proposed resuming SAA talks if the Serbian authorities developed a plan for arresting Ratko Mladic. The EU then announced that talks about resuming SAA would begin but did not set a date for such uh, resumption. Perhaps in the interest of time, I'll skip my, my second snapshot. But the point I want to convey here is that the decision to make the linkage and maintain it from 1997 until 2010 approximately played a key role in realizing the demands of victims to see senior indictees brought to justice. But from the snapshots, we see justice being dialed down, if you will, to accommodate the perceived need for political stability democratic transition. Consistent pressure for arrest and surrender of key ICTY indictees was increasingly deemed to be an obstacle to these important but non-judicial objectives of states. Of course, there can be tension between strong diplomatic, political, economic support to enforce arrest warrants on the one hand and competing political demands of states on the other. Uh, this tension, however, leads to inconsistent support that waxes and wanes as non-judicial objectives come into play. I believe what's called for on the part of states is persistence in firmly wielding pressure along with smart incentives. It's to the European Union's credit that it maintained its conditionality for so long. But the lesson learned here, I would argue, is that to be effective on behalf of the justice norm, states have to be prepared to keep at it. 
taking a longer view of course diplomatic support for justice is a new trend that arose with the work of the ICTY. Accountability and commitment to it coexists in a fragile interface, rhetoric notwithstanding from various capitals, with many more traditional interests of sovereignty that tend to get greater weight. When competing objectives come into play, all too often political actors waver in their support for justice. It's a long-term struggle to push state actors to adhere to their commitment to the judicial norm, making justice as prominent as it should be in the sphere of policy objectives. But this is the terrain we work on. EU conditionality, U.S. government's uh, cuts in economic support was an important step. The work of the ICTY was essential in bringing all this to the fore as state practice. And while it's an uphill climb, it's the more consistent, unflinching support for tribunals, for the International Criminal Court. Uh, that's the direction the international community has to go. I want to say a word before I conclude about national trials, because I believe that is another very important legacy of this tribunal. As the fight against impunity has advanced, there is correctly a deepening understanding of the fundamental importance and inherent difficulties in conducting national trials as the first line of accountability for serious international crimes. The ICTY has an interesting and distinctive legacy. This tribunal spurred war crimes proceedings, as has been uh, referred to across the Western Balkans. And this impact, I contend, is more important, more timely now, given the current attention on what has come to be known as positive complementarity in the context of the International Criminal Court. Um, I think it's uh, understandable that the ICTY came late to the, the role of strengthening national uh, courts prosecutions in the Western Balkans has a lot, I believe, to the nature of the Security Council resolution creating the tribunal, the nature of the conflict uh, in the Balkans, and I would add the sheer novelty of the first ever international tribunal since Nuremberg. I, I say that not to apologize to the organizers of this event uh, and the president of the ICTY, but I think fairness requires uh, uh, some understanding of uh, the comprehension at the time. But the, the tribunal did a lot. And I, I won't go into the role of the Rule 11 beast transfer of cases and Category 2 cases, etc. Um, but I do want to pose a couple of questions that I think are important, and I'll stop there. First, given the ICTY's late but extensive efforts on behalf of strengthening national prosecutions, what can be learned in this area of judicial capacity building? To what extent can international judicial mechanisms, with differences between them, actually catalyze national proceedings. Two, to what extent did its work with national authorities contribute substantively to building respect for the broader rule of law in the states of the Western Balkans? I raise this because a question has emerged about whether assistance specifically designated for war crimes proceedings has a spillover effect on the broader legal system. This is an intensely debated question currently in the development community, heightened again by the consideration of positive complementarity. Three, what can be learned from the ICTY's experience in capacity building about the dynamism, if any, 
in advancing political will on the part of states to prosecute. We know that overcoming unwillingness is much more difficult than addressing technical or capacity issues. I believe thoughtful reflection on these questions will add to the ICTY's legacy. In conclusion, through its work, actually, uh, the work of individuals committed to a lofty objective and a unique judicial institution, the ICTY in these two areas is leaving a rich legacy that needs to be mined further so that everything that can be gleaned from 20 years practice will be extracted to make trials more fair, efficient, and meaningful in the communities most affected by the crimes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Bill Shabas will address us on issues concerning minority rights and the relationship uh, with the European Court. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll, I think I'll also stay put at this end of the stage. When the uh, tribunal was established in 1993, it found itself situated in a way with two other much larger international judicial institutions, one of them quite close by and one a bit further away. I'm referring to the International Court of Justice uh, just up the road and the uh, European Court of Human Rights. Really, I should be precise and mention also the European Commission, which existed at the time, and I pay homage to Judge Trexel, who was the last uh, chair of the, or president of the European Commission of Human Rights. Um, with respect to the International Court of Justice, much has been written. There were uh, some little skirmishes in a way, but in, the, in retrospect, they look more like lovers' quarrels between the, uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the International Court of Justice. And ultimately, I think the two institutions have, have, have developed a a common, coherent uh, narrative of the, of the conflict in the decisions. It's not over yet, but it seems to be fairly, fairly consistent. And the old fears of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of, of a division in the case law have not really proven to be very well founded. With respect to the European Court of Human Rights, I think the story is a little different. I, I believe that Many defense lawyers probably thought in the early days that the cases, the, the, the unsatisfactory results in the appeals chamber here at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia would ultimately end up in Strasbourg. And, and that really hasn't proven to be the case. I don't think any defense lawyer has figured out the way to unlock Strasbourg uh, to make it accessible to, to challenge decisions of the, of the, of the tribunal. Um, Perhaps there's still more to come. I sense that there's a little matter concerning a book published in Paris that may be working its way towards Strasbourg. But uh, I don't know if that will, uh, that case will prosper either. Um, the court, of course, the tribunal has often cited uh, the case law, but it's not automatic, the case law of Strasbourg. There was a very early case, I think actually one of the very first judicial decisions. Uh, Judge McDonald was involved in it in the trial chamber in Tadich that dealt with, the, um, with anonymous witnesses. And the defense lawyer, I think, came with a great case from the European Court of Human Rights against the Netherlands and thought that this was going to be a simple victory and, of course, learned that it wasn't exactly automatic that the case law of Strasbourg would apply at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. I suppose in those early days it wasn't even obvious that uh, the, the place that human rights was going to find in the International Criminal Tribunal. Um, some of the personnel came from a human rights background, more of that in a minute, but they also came from various other backgrounds. It wasn't as it is today where we can draw upon a, a huge body of experienced professionals from the field of international criminal law, international criminal justice. And so there were military lawyers who came here. There were some of the war crimes lawyers and prosecutors from national jurisdictions. And a group, but I don't think they were at all predominant, of people from the human rights stream. First and foremost, of course, among them, our dear departed friend Nino Cassese. 
But there were others. Theo van Boven was here at the beginning, a great Dutch international human rights lawyer. And a Canadian, I, I feel compelled to mention the Canadian, being the only non-American on the, the panel here this afternoon. Um, Jules Deschamps, some of you will remember him. And uh, Jules Deschamps sat uh, also with Nino in the, in the appeals chamber, along with Georges Abissab, in the Tadic case, in the famous decision. Since we're all reminiscing a little bit, uh, I remember the, the morning of the decision, or the afternoon, I suppose, but it was the morning in Quebec. I was living in Montreal then, and the, the fax machine started warring. This is the 2nd of, of October, 1995. The fax machine started warring. I would be one of uh, some of Jules Deschamps' friends and colleagues back in Canada, and he was giving us a heads up on this important decision. You all know what a fax machine is, the younger people. We had this in the previous century, to, it's sort of a primitive kind of PDF. And uh, lo and behold, uh, Jules Duchesne was sending us a, a message about the, about the decision. But it, it had nothing to do with crimes against humanity or with serious violations of the laws and customs of war. It was about the fact that the decision was coming out in English only and not in French. It's a little three-page decision. Some of you will remember it. And that was, that was the principal message we got. It took us several more days before we got the whole decision and realized that something rather earth-shaking had happened in, uh, in international law. The, um, at the time, also, there were interesting things going on in international human rights law. And I think this did influence the tribunal. There had been a great resurgence in interest in the law concerning uh, minorities, national minorities, starting probably with the Copenhagen document of the Commission for Security and Cooperation, or the, the Conference for, Commission for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, the, European, uh, the, the Council of Europe had adopted a framework convention. There was the famous General Assembly resolution. That was as far as the as the General Assembly in the United Nations was able to take the issue of minority rights protection, except that it also established this tribunal. And I think it's interesting to think about the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia as being a tribunal for the protection of minorities, as being an instrument for the protection of national minorities from the, uh, what is the, the, the great threat, the great attack uh, upon their existence. Minorities, of course, have, a, have a, an uneven history, even within the field of human rights law. They were back at the time of the, in the years following the First World War, in the League of Nations, in many ways quite central to what was going on in human rights. But that was eclipsed at the time of the Second World War. In our, uh, our, our current understanding of the Nuremberg trial, we think that it's a trial also about minorities and about the Holocaust. But, of course, on close scrutiny, uh, it wasn't really mainly about that. The, the issue of human rights and of the protection of minorities played a small role in the Nuremberg judgment, which was essentially about crimes against peace and, and uh, the violation of the, the, the commission of crimes against peace uh, by the Nazis in waging an aggressive war. But over time, human rights came to be more and more central to international criminal justice. I would say it wasn't even obvious when the statute was adopted, because if one looks at the crimes under the statute of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, we start with grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. Um, that, that's proven to be a bit of a dud, really, nothing of any great significance in the case law. Then we move on to the laws and customs of war, and one of Dino Cassese's interesting contributions in the, in the, or the judges of the appeals chamber, I should say, in the Tadish decision, was to remind us that uh, international humanitarian law was a modern formulation of the laws and customs of war that had been, in a sense, um, imbued with uh, modern human rights law. But with, with respect to minorities, uh, of course, the real form that this took in the case law of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia was with what we might call the criminalization of ethnic cleansing. It doesn't say ethnic cleansing in the statute, there's no reference to it uh, in the statute, but of course it's been frequently used throughout the case law of the tribunal from the, from the earliest days. I suppose that today we could almost call it a technical term because it's, it's used in the General Assembly Resolution on the Responsibility to Protect of 2005. But it's not in the statute and it's not in any of the, the previous treaties. The term began to be used really rather generally in the, in the early 1990s to describe the, 
uh, attacks, persecution, and the driving out of minorities from their historic uh, homeland. Um, in the case law, and I know others will speak about it tomorrow, so I don't want to, 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 to encroach upon this too much, but in the case law on genocide, much of the debate has been tracing the line between genocide and crimes against humanity to the extent that, that we can trace one. And uh, frequently reference is made to the fact that when the Genocide Convention was adopted in 1948, there were attempts to include a, a very precise provision dealing with ethnic cleansing in the Genocide Convention. I think there's a reference to this in the Tadic Appeals decision. I think it's also in uh, Judge Shahabuddin's dissent, and it's certainly in the International Court of Justice decision between Bosnia and, and Serbia. Uh, the proposal, the famous proposal from 1948 came from Syria, and it was to have a sixth act of genocide, which was driving people out of their ancestral homeland. At the time, Syria was obviously referring to uh, uh, the creation of Israel and the attacks on the Palestinians that were involved at that time. But there was great reluctance to include this, I think because there was no con consensus at all that those types of acts were even forbidden by international law, that they were, and certainly not that they were criminal. There's a famous uh, debate in the, or, or, or discussion in the Institut de droit international in 1952 about whether uh, the expulsion of minorities, or the, tr the, the transfer of minorities, or the forced displacement of minorities, uh, would be considered uh, unlawful under public international law. And most of the members at the time, the great names in public international law, said no. That states were always entitled to push minorities around if they felt that they were dangerous or subversive and that they could move them around. Only one uh, member of the Institute on that committee, Georges Sell, the French international lawyer, had the courage or the foresight to say that this was now forbidden by international law and the example, uh, the, the reference that he gave was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But even in the 1970s, not that far away from the Balkans, we had examples of ethnic cleansing. I'm thinking of the island of Cyprus, which became essentially ethnically cleansed in both directions in 1974 with the assistance of the United Nations whose buses transferred populations from one end to the other of the island. And, of course, when the wars broke out in the Balkans, there were many public figures in uh, international affairs who suggested that maybe this was the solution as well uh, to ethnic conflict in the Balkans. What the tribunal has done is clarified the fact that ethnic cleansing uh, fits, within, uh, fits within the broad umbrella of crimes against humanity, where exactly? There's been some debate. Is this deportation? Is it other inhumane acts? Um, I don't know that it's necessary to resolve this once we've acknowledged that this is now criminalized. This is a great achievement uh, in international law. It shows the dynamism of, of international law, the progressive development of international law, and we should all welcome the fact that now our, our human right, which is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to remain in our country, to remain where we were born, if we so wish, and to return to it, um, is now protected at another level uh, via the mechanisms of international criminal justice and the concept of crimes against humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, and there you are, very thought-provoking presentations here, and I'm sorry, um, we've encroached a bit on the discussion time, but the floor is open. Yeah, go ahead. Je m'exprimerai en français. poser une première question. Où est la défense J'ai entendu parler d'arrestation, j'ai entendu parler de condamnation, j'ai entendu parler des juges, j'ai entendu parler des procureurs, comme 
étant à l'origine de l'héritage de ce tribunal, où est la défense Je crois qu'il y a eu dans ce tribunal des apports importants de la défense. Dans cette salle même, il y a quelques années, le procureur Goldstone s'adressait à l'ensemble des avocats de la Cour pénale internationale. Il leur racontait les débuts du tribunal pénal international pour lex yougoslavie et il disait ceci, « Il ne peut pas y avoir de justice pénale internationale sans une défense forte. » Alors, je, je lance véritablement un appel, comme je le fais souvent, à mesdames et messieurs les juges de ces tribunaux. De grâce, vous, les juges, vous n'êtes pas là pour lutter contre l'impunité. Le seul qui est là pour lutter contre l'impunité, il s'appelle le procureur. Après avoir entendu le procureur, après avoir entendu la défense, les juges sont chargés de dire quelle est la justice, quelle est la loi. Est-ce que la personne qui est dans le box est coupable ou non coupable Telle est la mission des juges. Si en remplissant leur mission, les juges peuvent concourir à la lutte contre l'impunité, tant mieux. Mais ça n'est pas leur mission première. De même que les juges ne sont pas chargés de la réconciliation. La réconciliation est le fruit de la justice. Ça n'est pas sa mission première. Et Madame Pilet, je vous remercie, vous avez parlé euh, des accusés, de ces accusés à qui euh, on donne des sentences à vie. Et en tant que haut commissaire, vous vous êtes interrogé aussi sur ces questions. Je livre à votre réflexion cette citation de l'ambassadeur français des droits de l'homme qui répète souvent « Les droits de l'homme sont établis pour les victimes, mais ils prennent tout leur sens quand il s'agit de défendre des accusés. » Le procès équitable, l'article 14 du pacte, c'est précisément pour défendre le droit des accusés. Devant le tribunal pour lex yougoslavie comme devant le TPIR, il y a eu des avocats qui se sont levés pour défendre les accusés, ils ont aidé la justice, il y a eu devant le TPY un certain nombre d'acquittements, il faut le rappeler, est-ce que ces acquittements servaient la justice ou est-ce qu'ils la desservaient J'assume que les acquittements rendus par le tribunal pour lex yougoslavie ont servi la cause de la justice parce qu'ils ont prouvé qu'effectivement les juges sont là pour dire le droit. Voilà les petites réflexions que je euh, voulais vous faire. Deux observations, en parlant notamment des, des victimes. J'ai fait partie de ceux qui ont beaucoup milité pour l'accès des victimes devant nos tribunaux internationaux. Et je continue, mais je dis aussi que nous ne savons pas encore comment faire réellement. Nous avons beaucoup de progrès à faire concernant l'accès des victimes. Comment est-ce que ça se, peut se passer, notamment dans les crimes de masse J'étais euh, l'avocat de Douk au Cambodge et nous avons pu mesurer la difficulté euh, de la présence des victimes euh, dans, les, dans, dans les, les, les procès pour crimes de masse. Et pourtant, il faut qu'elles soient là. Mais nous n'avons pas fini la réflexion et nous devons faire preuve encore d'imagination pour donner leur juste place aux victimes dans les procès internationaux. Et puis, juste une dernière réflexion, Madame euh, Pilet, euh, concernant tribunaux internationaux, tribunaux hybrides, je veux juste vous dire quelque chose ici sur ce qui s'est passé au Cambodge. Tribunal difficile, le tribunal pour les Khmer Rouges au Cambodge, tribunal difficile tribunal non pas hybride mais internationalisé dit-on dans le pays même sauf que 30 000 Cambodgiens sont venus assister au procès au premier procès énorme succès pour la justice pénale internationalisée 30 000 Cambodgiens nous n'avons jamais connu ça dans d'autres tribunaux donc euh, 
je n'ai pas, pas d'avis définitif. Est-ce que les tribunaux doivent être à l'extérieur Est-ce qu'ils doivent être dans les pays Je dis seulement que ça demande euh, à être médité. Quand ça se passe dans un pays, quand on permet aux citoyens de venir voir comment fonctionne la justice, c'est aussi euh, extrêmement important pour ce que nous sommes en train d'essayer de faire. Je vous remercie. Well, let me um, let me jump in as a person who's uh, had his last uh, before I became an ambassador was a prosecutor for 18 years, but after 20 years of being a defense attorney, uh, um, and I was intending in my remarks if I've had a few more minutes to, to talk about part of the success of, of uh, is the way in which the trials have been conducted, in which the defense has uh, has been able to. Uh, Uh, to challenge the charges, uh, examine the witnesses, uh, in, in many cases uh, uh, acquittals, uh, the result uh, on counts or, or entirely. And, uh, and I think one of the successes of the ICTY and of, of the other institutions has been uh, the, the, the provision of, of, of defense for, for, for each of, of, of the accused uh, persons. And I hope uh, the defense has an opportunity to participate uh, on panels uh, to, to, to discuss these issues. Uh, in regard to your victim uh, issue, uh, I think it's important to, I mean, I, I tend to share your view, um, maybe it's because of the system that, that I belong to, that, uh, that the victims uh, are, need to be recognized, the, 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 the suffering that they experience, they need to, as has been said uh, this morning, the, the right of reparation needs to be recognized. Uh, but I do see the, the process of, of Of, and then working uh, with the prosecution uh, to present such evidence as they have on the question of culpability and, and then to participate in, in the question of, of reparation in, in another part of the proceeding. And it does bother me, frankly, when I see uh, uh, cases with, you know, one prosecutor gets up and then multiple prosecutors sort of rise, et cetera. And I, and I think that, that's, that to some extent that makes these trials more difficult. Um, I understand the concerns of the victims, and, but I believe that the appropriate place for them to work is with the prosecution on the issue of culpability, and that they really have an interest when, when it comes to the, the, the reparation uh, at the end of the day. But uh, we'll see how this works in, uh, in, in Cambodia now with almost 4,000 victims certified in case two, and we'll see how uh, it works uh, as, as, as the ICC finishes uh, uh, trials that, that have Uh, become, I think, longer even for relatively brief, uh, uh, I mean, uh, small events to some extent, or, or limited cases have ended up being very long trials in part because of, of, of this experiment and, and, and whether in, in the end it serves the interests of justice or the victims themselves. Judge McDonald. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to take up the challenge from you, Mr. Dicker, I think as to re when you suggested that we explore the question of to what extent uh, the ICTY can, if I understand it correctly, import or export the rule of law to the region of the former Yugoslavia through supporting uh, or by supporting its national prosecutions. Did I understand that that was kind of your, your mandate to us? And if so, I'd like to comment on that. If that's not your question, then I'll just pass the microphone to someone else. It, 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 it was a little different, uh, Judge, in the sense that um, there is, as I, I alluded, quite a debate about the overall impact of support for proceedings at national at the national level um, against uh, most serious crimes what positive spillover effect does that have 
in strengthening the overall rule of law system. And, and uh, in a word, we get a lot of pushback from development agencies who say, don't ask us as a development agency to support a war crimes tri tribunal or proceeding in, in Congo. We have to build the whole system of uh, the rule of law in the country. And there is no spillover. This is too specific an area for us to support in a country where people, where there's an ordinary murder, there's no access to uh, a criminal form. Well, I don't, I don't know that I can answer the, the specific question about the spillover effect. I did visit uh, the, uh, the former Yugoslavia, Sarajevo, in 2003 as a, as a civilian uh, after I had left the tribunal and met with a number of individuals, really as a result of the uh, outreach program to get their, their view of, uh, of, of what success, if any, the outreach program had been. But let me comment on this, though, because there may be an assumption in your question, and you, you, you referenced the late um, involvement of the ICTY in, in helping to build the national courts. And the reason that that was so um, is that there is a difference of opinion as to the role of courts, even at international courts. There were many who disagreed with uh, any effort to do anything other than try individuals. You know, that's what courts are, 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 are designed to do and, and hopefully do well. Um, but I did believe, as we mentioned, the outreach program, that there was more to it, and primarily because of the mandate that the ICTY has to, that was given to it by the Security Council to help to bring about and maintain international peace and security. That's an extraordinary mandate, uh, which I may talk about tomorrow. Uh, and um, I think that the Security Council had to give us that mandate because it was um, building up, so to speak, support for the exercise of its Chapter 7 powers. So if it did not conclude that a court of law would help to bring about and, and maintain international peace and security, then it, the establishment was suspect. So I don't know what came first. Uh, I, didn't know, I don't know whether the mandate came as a justification of the establishment or whether it was, in fact, a factor in the establishment. It came late, though, and if I may put in a plug for my chef de cabinet, David Talbert, uh, he wrote an article, Diane, you, you may know better than I when the article was, but in the article, it may have appeared in American University. Uh, long, no? I think it may be Fletcher, but go ahead. Anyway, yeah. in any case, he, he wrote an article in which he proposed this, uh, the assistance of the ICTY to build up the national courts. It was late in coming, as I said, because even the outreach program uh, uh, was late in coming, in, in my estimation. Now, perhaps, since I've been away so long, maybe another judge wants to fast forward it uh, and bring it into this century. But that's kind of my, my thought about it. Yes, there is a role. Yes, it helps to bring the rule of law. Yes, tribunals should do it. The ICC itself I, I has been given the mandate, at least, or the, the wish that states will incorporate its procedures. So let's continue. Um, my name is Nick Lamer from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, one little comment and one question. A comment about the following, uh, which refers a little bit to the first intervention uh, by the audience. In 2004, uh, the Journal of International Criminal Tra uh, Justice, under the editorship of uh, Professor Cassese, came out with a, uh, a, a view on the first 10 years of the ICTY, uh, with contributions from, I think, uh, 30 people from within the institution, from academics. Um, very interesting, uh, but I sent a little note to Professor Cassese and said, but what happened to the voices in the region? Why not include, there was not one uh, voice from the region included in those reflections on the ICTY. And he responded to me and he said, we forgot. My same question to you, um, who forgot the voices from the region in the panel? 
My, my other question is, um, would there be, I don't know whom I would pose the question, but is there any uh, reflection or evaluation or lessons for a future global justice on the selection process within the, the ISTY, and I mean the selection of the 161 defendants. Are there any, any reflections on that, uh, to my view, important topic? Thank you. Well, that, that, that's a salient point where the voices of the people for whom this justice is being rendered and that's my mandate as High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, and that's why I allowed Diane to speak over time, because she brought to us the voices from the ground. I think it's very important research that you did um, with, with regard to the accused. So I'll, I'll leave it to Diane and Stephen to comment. Well, maybe I'll say a, a, make a general observation. And since um, Stephen has been in a position as an international prosecutor of dealing with this issue, directly, um, I, I will yield to him. I do think it's one of the most um, important questions um, that will establish the credibility of a tribunal um, in the region affected by its work. That's particularly true um, for the ICTY, uh, but I think elsewhere. Um, it, there's a huge burden on the prosecutor of an international tribunal that can only select a handful of cases to prosecute out of thousands of potential defendants. And, um, and it, this is in some ways even more true for the ICC, which has the world as a potential, um, it, I mean, not, the, not the entire world, but a vast part of the globe um, is potentially uh, a focus area of its prosecutions, which means that typically the prosecutor brings charges only against a handful of people. And the symbolism of the selection becomes hugely important in establishing um, the moral message of the tribunal's work or in an ethnically divided society um, in, in, in addressing perceptions of bias on the part of the court. Um, I, I, and so, you know, I, I think I'm sort of stating the obvious, but I really want to just agree with the premise of your question that I think um, it's nothing could be more important, and I mean, I shouldn't say that. There are a lot of important things, but it's a very important um, consideration as well. Um, clearly, people in the region, in the Balkans, um, are hugely attentive to the question of the quality of, I mean, really, it comes down to um, minute things like the quality of the uh, prosecutors assigned to particular cases and so forth. So again, I think um, we have to be aware of just how keenly attentive some audiences are to, to these selection um, processes. Steve, do you want to yeah, say well, something? Let me just add to this, because I think we've seen a transition in this discussion about what international justice uh, can do, what international justice should do in the life of the ICTY and the ICTR and in the courts that have, that have followed. If you looked at the statutes of both the ICTY, ICTR, and 93-94, they speak of prosecuting those responsible for genocide and other serious violations of international humanitarian law committed in whatever place and time. And uh, that uh, the later, uh, after uh, this court had begun and was charging individuals and initially uh, charging those people that it could get its hands on and then eventually doing a more focused approach, you had in the, in the completion strategy direction given to the, by the Security Council, most firmly in, in, in Security Council Resolution 1503 in August of, of 2003, this direction to basically transfer cases of mid-level and lower-level offenders uh, to the region uh, and to focus uh, on, on the higher level. And as someone then involved in the process with the ICTR, I remember just as becoming chief of prosecutions, having to uh, deal with a GAMA list that had once had more than 200 names on it and eventually bring it down to eight more people uh, that we would indict and then try to figure out how justice could be done uh, in, in these other cases. So the tribunals were, were forced as they closed to limit their mandate and to make these transfers, either through the 11 this process that the judges established or through what was called here the Category 2 process of, of transferring files uh, to the region. But then when 
other courts were established in that same era, you had, as I experienced in Sierra Leone, the mandate of only trying those with the greatest responsibility. And in Cambodia, the leaders of democratic Kampuchea and those most responsible. So the perception clearly became, when it came to international justice, one needed to focus on really the, the higher level individuals. Now, of course, that's been very challenging sometimes to define, and it's an issue that's, that's still being confronted in Cambodia. Then, of course, with the ICC, with the prosecutor having to deal with the the whole world, the, the 119 countries that are in, or other cases that may come this way from the, or away from the Security Council, clearly you can't prosecute more than a handful in any situation. So how do you, how do you deal with this? And I think this has led to this basic ap approach, which is uh, prosecutors need to, uh, to prioritize, which comes hard for people that come out of a civil law tradition where there's a responsibility to prosecute everything, but you basically have to, to, to seek, you know, to to, to focus on, on cases that are representative of, of the conduct that occurred during, uh, during the atrocities and that reflect uh, basically a priority to take on those that are at the highest level, but the highest level against whom uh, responsibility can, can be shown through the, through the evidence. And, and so that's, I think, the approach that, that we take. Now, obviously, this leads to a lot of dissatisfaction. In Sierra Leone, where we had this great outreach program, myself and my predecessors, when going to every town and hill, uh, where they were always saying, why didn't you prosecute the person that killed a thousand people down the road? And we'd say, well, we've got this, this, narrow, this narrow mandate. But I think we then recognize that justice for the rest of the trials need to be done either at the national level or through some other mechanism. Uh, the key element of this, I think, uh, the ICC prosecutor recognizes this in the, in the policies that he's adopted, is people need to know, they need to understand why you made the decisions that you did. You can't just sit in your office and say, I made the decisions, I know. You basically have to go out and answer the questions on the hill and in the town of the child that comes up to you and said, you know, I've read your statute, why isn't this guy most responsible? You have to publish the standards by which you, you make these decisions. But that, I think, is the direction international justice uh, must go in the future. Um, I'll, I'll just give the floor to Bill Shabbos and then Judge Robinson is waiting to. I sense the clock ticking, so I'll be very brief, but I wanted to just add a comment on this question of the selection of defendants, which is, of course, even more acute at the International Criminal Court where we have the problem of the selection of the situation as well as the individual defendants. I think it's one of the great unresolved problems of international criminal uh, law and I don't think we have got an adequate model or an adequate explanation for it. Um, we, we, we have cases where prosecutors essentially are left at all of these tribunals with total independence and no oversight whatsoever we want it that way because we want to have an independent prosecutor and we think this is the only way to have justice that is properly independent and impartial. But at the same time, it's a total mystery how these decisions are made finally. And Steve, you mentioned the, the prosecutor of the ICC going out and explaining the decisions. I, I mean, I, I hear reports of his explanations and I hear people who hear him explain the decisions and it's usually one word, gravity. Or sometimes it's, we count. And that's not really, that doesn't tell me why you're prosecuting the Lord's Resistance Army rather than the government forces in Uganda, why you're going into uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire rather than uh, Iraq or Afghanistan. I don't think we have adequate answers to these questions. At the Yugoslavia Tribunal, of course, we have a prosecutor who has a relatively short term and who is also accountable, although we've never had a recall, Although I dare say that had Carla Del Ponte in 2000 said, you know, we've investigated the bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999, and I've decided I'm going to stop going after the Serbs and the Croats and the Bosniaks, and I'm going to concentrate on NATO. I expect there would have been a rather quick Security Council meeting, and sparks would have fly, and we would have seen what happens to a prosecutor who makes a legitimate choice that isn't quite within the parameters of the political map. But at the ICC... We can't even do that, and it's nine years. Uh, and, and I think that we probably haven't yet solved that problem in the international criminal law. We don't have an adequate answer to this problem. So I think that's leading us to dimensions of selectivity and politicization. And I've noted you here. And recently I uh, delivered an address before the uh, 
uh, retreat of the uh, International Criminal Court on the Security Council referrals? Shouldn't there be objective criteria in the, in, uh, in the referrals to avoid politicization and selectivity? Um, <laughs> so I have Judge Robinson and, and noted you next year. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. I don't wish to appear to be yeah. overly defensive in relation to the representation of the voices from the region, but the first legacy conference, which we had last year, February, was devoted precisely to the, to the region, and the region was um, fully represented um, in all panels, and particularly on the floor. Uh, those of you who were here will recall the very uh, dramatic uh, presentations that we had from the voices from the region, uh, which doesn't mean, of course, that there need be no voice from the region in this conference. We welcome that voice at all times. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think I, I do appreciate, but my appeal is to the, uh, the organizers. I did actually concur with him. My, my main issue is on the defense. I was of the view that if it were possible, if it is not too late as yet, that we can probably have somebody from the defense section just to tell us the difficulties they go through. We are talking about international issues, people coming from Yugoslavia to, to here, and the, as most of you are aware of the situation of the ICT era, the problems they have been having with the governments, the, the, uh, the defense force uh, uh, lawyers have been having with the government. What about the ICTY? Are uh, there no problems that the defense lawyers normally face. If it were possible that we could probably have somebody just to run us through and see what difficulties they normally uh, incur, probably it will complete the issue of justice. Because the justice we have been hearing about is the justice from the prosecution. We have not heard the justice from the defense. Because to me, justice means the two sides have been heard on a fair and level ground. Only then could I probably come up and say, yes, there was some good justice in this issue. Thank you very much. Well, there's an important point. The voice of defense is missing here. Let me say from myself, 14 years service as an international judge, we wouldn't have the quality of justice we have today had it not been for the Defense Council who challenge and, and um, confront us into addressing all issues and, and just advancing jurisprudence. I always notice how the quality of defense made a difference to the fertile rights of the accused person. So I want to acknowledge the two Defense Council here and your role and do encourage you, uh, Judge Robinson, to have not just prosecution on the podium here, but defense. I thought I saw two hands. Oh, I see three. two in the back, sir. Just hold on, let me take the two in the back first. first. May I? Okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, Ambassador Rapp made a very interesting comment because uh, as I just saw this last minute, uh, it is as if we had a soccer match or a baseball match between uh, prosecutor and defense. And uh, of course, if we think too much on justice for the victims, if we are thinking about this sort of individualized reparation, I mean, the task cannot be performed because very often you have mass violations of human rights. So I think what uh, has to be stressed more and I didn't see it enough here, uh, is that justice, the rule of law, and public order are common goods, public goods, and this is a role in itself. I mean, to the extent you can perform reparations to the victims, that's great. But the idea is that 
uh, overall impunity will not prevail. I think that's a basic thing when we are overcoming these uh, situations of civil war and so on. Uh, there is one question uh, which no one brought here. Uh, what comment can you, can you present about the situation in Kosovo? Well, as you, as you know, uh, there are charges of very serious violations of human rights, hundreds of murders, some cases with uh, uh, extraction of organs for transplant. There is a report by Swiss Senator Dick Marty about that, which was considered by the Security Council. Uh, that would be part of reconciliation in, in the region as well. So, uh, uh, justice as a public good and uh, Kosovo. Could I have comments on that? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have a contribution in the back and one here, and then close with the panel's responses. Uh, my name is Shereen Fisher. I am a Justice of Appeal in the Special Court for Sierra Leone. And I wanted to uh, get back to the point that was made a few comments ago about the voice of the courts in the region and the people in the region. And what I wanted to, uh, first of all, is thank the ICTY for its uh, uh, conference last February where that was a specific topic. But I would suggest that it cannot be isolated to one conference. Your legacy are those courts, because they will continue after the ICTY is over. And you do have that voice in this room. There are several members of the court of BIH that are here, many of them at their own expense. You have the president of the court, you have the registrar of the court, you have the head of the defense support team, you have the previous uh, president of the appeal chamber, you have several judges and several prosecutors from that court that are here to celebrate the ICTY legacy. And I suggest that you use those people to get the voice of the region because I have to agree that that voice needs to be heard not just once, but every time. Uh, the issues of the legacy of the ICTY are discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Final. Uh, distinguished uh, panelists, my name is John Commander. I am the current president of the Special Consulate in Leon. What I want to really say thanks to the ICTY and appreciate the fact that we have depended on the jurisprudence as we have in our statute, we set us up, said that uh, we would depend on the jurisprudence of the ICTY and ICTR as an initial situation until we were confident enough to build up our own jurisprudence, which I don't say we have now built up and uh, there are no making decisions which we have reached in terms of uh, gender crimes, forced marriage, uh, peacekeepers who are arrested, and uh, such like things. But then I come to this point about the fact that we are also in our closing stages, I know the ICTY is now in its completion stage, but I must say that we will be the first to go. And there is so much yet between us that we have to discuss in terms of how these matters might be uh, handled. One particular point I wish to raise is the situation that uh, pertains to witnesses, witness protection. This has been handled very well in the uh, Special Court of Sierra Leone, and I know it's been handled also at the ICTY. But then, the difference between ICTY and our court is the fact that we are based in the country where the crimes themselves were committed. And this certainly exposes not only witnesses, but the principles to whatever harm 
we are protecting the businesses against. I was asking the question simply to be told or to have the views of the panel, what happens in a country where the legacy does not take care of the principles and they are the ones who might, just because the evidence has found them culpable to say your time of imprisonment is so many years or you are free and so on. My point is that these persons are themselves liable for protection. And that's the point I want to make. As I think people know, the, the ICTY prosecutor brought cases uh, uh, for crimes uh, committed uh, by, by various groups in the Balkans, including crimes committed against Serbs by, by ethnic Kosovars. Um, obviously, not uh, there's not been a lot of convictions in that area, and though there's recently the Sarabnai case where the acquittal was set aside and it's being retried. Uh, the witness raised specifically the evidence developed by, by the Swiss Senator and former investigative magistrate to Dick Marty uh, for the Council of Europe in regard to crimes against uh, ethnic Serbs in Kosovo and potential organ trafficking. And uh, the international community has supported uh, an effort to investigate that and a special mission has been established uh, uh, in Brussels uh, under Ulex. Uh, the European Union actually appointed my predecessor as ambassador for war crimes, Clint Williamson, to head that, but it includes uh, people from multiple nationalities. And they're working with, uh, with Senator Marty and with, and with the authorities in the region uh, to get uh, all of the evidence and to develop uh, the cases that are there to proceed with them without, without fear or favor. And, and we're supporting that effort. I think we see uh, in all sorts of situations, uh, places where justice needs to be done, where it can't necessarily be done in a tribunal which is closing its uh, doors now on the completion strategy, and we have to come up with mechanisms uh, for doing it. And, and that's being done in the, in the case of these alleged crimes in Kosovo. Can I um, address a couple of points <coughs> briefly? One, if I can add one uh, response on the question of selection of um, defendants to bills. I, I, I want to say there's one um, justification uh, for selection that I, that I think is important, and it's tricky in application, but that is there have been a number of situations where countries genuinely can't handle in domestic courts certain high-profile perpetrators who would, whose prosecution locally would be destabilizing. And I've been struck that even local prosecutors um, who have a great deal of pride about their own, in their own capacity to prosecute um, war crimes domestically have acknowledged that there were certain people like that, for example, um, in Serbia, but also in other countries. So I think that's um, one fairly important and legitimate ground for selection. On um, the question about reparations, um, it's a huge topic, and, and I, I, with others who've spoken earlier, think we have um, not uh, begun to tackle that in an appropriate way for victims. But I wanted to use your question as an opportunity um, to, to say that um, in, in my interviews in Bosnia, when I talked to victims about what they thought the ICTY had achieved and what they were um, disappointed in, I didn't put the question that way, but that's how, how the answer sort of um, uh, shook out. Victims, um, uh, Bosniak victims, always mention the judgment um, that what happened in Srebrenica was genocide as, as a source of deep moral satisfaction. And so, and I think that's in, in the nature of um, the kind of uh, moral reparation you were talking about. I also want to just briefly mention that um, I was struck at, and, and happily struck to, to see that um, victims of gender violence in Bosnia had the, a similar sense of moral vindication in the judgments that um, Patty Sellers was talking about earlier. Uh, it, the contributions of the ICTY to gender justice have been widely hailed and rightly so. Um, I wasn't sure how important they were on the ground to victims, and, and I'm going to just quote one person I interviewed who tried to capture the importance of that, those um, judgments. She, the way she put it was that these judgments quote, created a new kind of awareness that women had been used as weapons of war. They became visible, personalized, and recognized as one kind of victim. And, and clearly there was uh, an element of moral satisfaction in those judgments. So may I, as a last word, say that uh, um, the 
ICTY's legacy continues in every line written into the Rome Statute, um, all the human rights protections, the protection of witnesses, the right of uh, victims to participate in the proceedings, and um, the right to victim assistance. The gaps that you pointed out are in there, and now we have to continue to help the process because it is indeed a huge challenge uh, to deliver justice in the ICC when you have, for instance, I was just told earlier today, 2,000 victims wishing to participate in a trial. So I don't know what you've started, but this is the legacy that is going to move on. And I want to thank the panel for the extremely interesting uh, contributions. And thank you very much. I hand over to the MC. Thank you. Thank you very much. This discussion concludes uh, the first day of this conference. And the ICTY is confident that you have heard many enriching contributions and that you have a lot to reflect upon tonight. Uh, the conference will resume tomorrow morning at 9.30 and we are looking forward to seeing you back. In the meantime, um, on behalf of the ICTY, I wish you a very good night and see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. <laughs>